Hello and welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. Today's question is, how can transactional analysis help improve behaviour and well-being? And my guest is Steve Russell. So my name's Steve Russell. Um, my work, my day-to-day work, I genuinely feel really privileged and blessed that I get out and I get to do what I love doing, and which is essentially helping people to draw the best out of themselves and indeed those they're teaching, supporting, leading and sometimes living with as well. So using a lot of psychology in very practical ways with very much a, a focus upon the positive. What's going well and well enough and how might you make some tweaks to make things even better? So we came to be talking on the podcast because uh, of transactional analysis and the question for today's uh, episode is how can transactional analysis help improve behaviour and well-being? So we probably need to take a step backwards a little bit there and start with what is transactional analysis, Steve? (laughs) That's a good question and it's probably one that's particularly pertinent given that I guess a lot of people will be tuning in will perhaps be from the world of education. Yeah. Um, transactional analysis probably isn't something that they're particularly familiar with, but in essence, it is a school of psychology. And like all schools of psychology, it it it, it aims to help to, to it aims to help us to make better sense of of behaviour, whether or not it's our own behaviour, or indeed that of children and young people in our schools, secure units, children children's homes, and the like. Um, just very briefly here, the origins of it go back to the 50s with a guy called Eric Byrne. And, and, and this is where I think this is an, a pertinent point, given that I'm talking about how it can help us within education. Because Eric Byrne, as a psychotherapist, was, was really keen to try, and, to try and shift the boundaries between the therapist and the client. He, he, it was almost like a bit of an act of rebellion of he didn't want clients, patients, sitting on the couch and him interpreting everything that they were telling him. He wanted to, to devise a language that would try and cre- create a greater sense of equality between the therapist and the patient or the client. Um, and, and I think here the, the relevance for ourselves within the world of education is that all of his ideas are are very easy to get your head around, certainly the core core ideas around from TA or transactional analysis. And then subsequently, after after he first developed it within the field of therapy, it's now been expanded across um, organisations. So we've got a lot lot of organisational consultants using it, um, coaches use it, and indeed people within education use it, both for staff themselves but also teaching children some of the ideas from TA to help to develop their emotional literacy. So what are the kind of basic ideas there? What does it actually look like kind of day to day? Yeah, what does it look like? Okay then. Um, So a couple of quick thoughts then here. Um, It's perhaps worth worth emphasising that a core assumption of of TA is that is that of I'm okay, you're okay, which might be a book one or two people have bumped into along their travels. This idea of, of that we've all got an intrinsic worth and value. And it's really out of that place and a belief that we can all change that then there's a range of ideas that look something like, for example, um, the idea of the parent, adult, child ego states. So this is demonstrated um, pictorially, I like visuals, of three constant three circles stacked on top of one another and the idea quite simply is that for example within the classroom a lot of the time I'll be in the parent ego state I'll be essentially making sure that children know what what to do and following through when they're not doing it and I'll be blending that structuring side with hopefully a lot of nurture as well so if you like you've got both both the the the, um, the, the parent who's in charge in terms of making sure that expectations are followed through but also that there's that caring, nurturing um, environment within the classroom. Um, And indeed, there might be times when I slip into using the child ego state, where perhaps I get a bit stroppy in the classroom because I get really, really frustrated with with certain youngsters. Or indeed, I'll pick up more likely children's child ego state behaviours. And uh, and the idea within, or one of the ideas within the ego states then, is that we try and and put as much energy into and occupy the adult ego state, which is about us being grounded, tuned in, very much in the here and now, and then working out, navigating our way through, so how much do I need to lean in here around structure, and how much do I need to bring in perhaps an added dose of nurture 
for example? Or do we need a little bit of fun and, and a different energy invested um, in, into the classroom? So that's one idea as to what TA looks like. And how did you come to be kind of using it in education? Can you tell mm. us a bit about you and your, your journey and, and why? Yes, yeah, sure. Like yeah, so, so I first came across it as a behaviour support teacher. Um, and, and I was fascinated by, by, by how the ideas that were being shared with me on that training um, really helped me in terms of forging healthy relationships with with folks in schools. So where I'm typically as a behavior support teacher, I was working with class teachers, senkos and the like. Um, it really helped me, the importance of contracting, the importance in other words, of making sure that we're really clear about the, the expectations in terms of why I'm in the school and what the teachers should be doing and what the youngsters should be doing, and what senior leaders should be doing. And so often time isn't spent checking out those expectations. And that's when we sometimes end up in some sticky situations. So I then um, started to really investigate transactional analysis and, and for myself um, was, was really struck by, by their take on child development actually. And so I guess in terms of how it's really informed and shaped my, my, my own practice as an educator has been looking at how, how the child development theory that TA has can really help us to look beyond youngsters behavior to their underlying developmental needs. Um, and with that, I've actually got it with me. I created in partnership with some uh, behaviour mentors down here in Lincolnshire, um, the Behaviour Wall, which is a way in which we can actually start to track a youngster's development right from birth and up to and including the teenage years. What does that, so the, I can see, I, for, for yeah. those who are listening, I can see a very colourful, um, kind of rainbow coloured many blocks. What, 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 tell me about the behaviour wall then, so it's sure. charting their development. Yeah, so it's charting their development. So the idea here on, on the behaviour wall post, and people want to get in touch with me, I'm happy to send across PDFs for them. But essentially the wall has, has different layers of bricks. And so each layer corresponds with a different developmental stage. So the bottom stage here, which is the red stage, is the being stage, which is first visited between the ages of naught to six months of age. This is the baby coming up the safety, security, warmth and familiarity of mum's womb into the big wide world and it's a scary place. And so what the baby needs to do is to start to get these developmental tasks under their belt or perhaps using the analogy of the behaviour wall, starting to get those bricks in place. And the bricks essentially around to call for care, to accept touch, to accept nurture, to bond emotionally. So it's very much around attachment theory, but in a way that I find is readily accessible for folks working in schools. And, and what I love, I love um, about this particular take on, on child development um, is that it's not just about what the baby or the child does, but it's also here on the flip side of the poster that you can see here, Pookie, is there's a lovely range of, of affirmations, supportive messages that will, that will essentially help to optimise the youngster's development through their particular stage that, that they're first visiting. So, for example, for the baby, um, the affirmations here are you belong here, what you need is important to us, we're glad you're here, we want you to be here, we want to care for you, we are glad you are you, and you can feel all of your feelings. So we get this, this great interaction of what the baby needs, and this is what key carers will do, often quite instinctively and intuitively, to support the baby's development. I was going to say, it, it, it feels to me like it's the sort of thing that that staff you know like, like in the role you were originally doing there is in behavior support i come across people who just do this all the time anyway and i find i don't know if you find this in your training but often my role is about helping people to realize what they're already doing well yes. and helping them understand that yep there's science behind that keep doing it do it more <laughs> oh, i could not agree more pookie you're talking my language because absolutely and again in terms of sharing um certainly in terms of the behavioral which is based i should say here on the cycle of development that's the theory within ta um but, but absolutely, I mean, I think Jean Ilsley Clark, who first came up with the cycle of development theory, tracking youngsters through the different developmental stages, um, she, she's done such a good job in terms of 
giving up giving us giving me the gift to be able to go into schools and say you're doing this already you just didn't know that there was a science a theory behind it yeah. but keep doing it and do more of it and hold on fast sometimes with some youngsters because we really have to persevere don't we Absolutely. And when you first came to understand about uh, transactional analysis and you were working in behaviour support, well, how did it kind of change your practice? Like what were the first things that you started doing and maybe what are the things you encourage others to do? Yeah. Um, OK, so um, having heard about the cycle of development theory, I then thought this, this theory that Jean came up with, this is such rich material. We must be able to get it out to schools. And so then off, off the back of that, the shift that happened for me in terms of consultations with staff was that so often the conversation with a class teacher would be, Steve, I don't know what else to do with this youngster. He's so immature. Often he, not exclusively so, but when it comes to behaviour, um, and we could get into that as, as to why it's often the boys who seem to raise their heads, as it were. But anyway, the conversations, yeah, he, he's so immature. What else can I do? And it was being able to then follow through on that. Tell me more about your sense that he is so immature, that there are gaps in his development. And then we were able to start to match what the teacher's observations were around the behavior. So really digging into what is it, what is it that you see the youngster doing? Let's move from he's disruptive to what do we see? What do you hear? How do you feel when he's behaving in these ways? Because of course, how we feel can give us clues as well as to what's going on internally for the youngster. And then starting to, to, to guide the teachers and the Senkos further down that road of, okay, so we can be more precise now. So you're saying that it feels like he's a toddler at times. Well, what does a toddler need? A toddler needs plenty of things to do, but safely, we need to channel that energy. Sometimes it even feels like he's a bit almost like babyish. He won't leave my side. There's all this attention seeking behavior that's going on and reframing that as attention needing because just as a baby will call out for care and needs that support, so too does this youngster. He might be a year six, he might be a year 11, yeah. or she might be a year 13. But if we can go back and support the youngster in revisiting those developmental stages, that's what's then going to help them to, to hopefully move move beyond these bumps that they're experiencing and, and, and indeed to flourish. And are there particular groups of children that you find yourself kind of working with more, supporting more when, when people are mm. asking for your help, your training? Yeah, and I think that there's, there's been quite a shift and I, I would say a welcome shift that now it's far more working around attachment and trauma. Mm -hmm. And so again, helping staff, particularly drawing on ideas from transactional analysis, you know, ab absolutely supporting them from the point of view of, no, you're not psychotherapists, you're not counsellors, but you're educators and you're flipping good at relationships. Yeah. And if it's the relationship that heals, then that's where we need to focus our energy. So very much um, a lot of work around attachment, trauma, ACEs, and developing staff awareness around those particular areas. And how about in the current context? So this podcast will go out in a few weeks time, but let's be honest, it's going on forever. So we're mid pandemic, <laughs> probably will be for some time. Um, and yeah, the world has shifted quite a lot in the last few months. Has that changed the, the kind of calls for your work um, and the things that schools are facing? Yes, yeah, definitely. So I would say here that two things, there's definitely been an even stronger focus on schools um, part in terms of wanting to understand better how they can how they can support those children and young people who are perhaps particularly struggling around COVID. We know it's not necessarily it's not that everybody is being traumatized in ways that are really visible, but definitely schools being more attuned to that. And also alongside that actually a real um, not a real but a, a growing awareness of just how much this is taking out of staff mm. in terms of staff well-being, and so a lot of my support around the coaching and the training is 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 sharing with staff some ideas that will help them to take better account in the first instance of just what this is taking out of them at the moment. If you take go with the idea of energy, they are pouring out so much energy on a daily basis, and often from places where by themselves internally they are struggling with a lot of anxiety and stress and pressure so providing staff with with some ideas that will help them to make 
better sense, I guess, of, the, of, of their own behaviours from that point of view. And are you being kind of welcomed warmly? Are staff recognising the, the need for this? Is it leaders recognising the need for their teams? Or, you know, what, 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 how's that kind of feeling on the ground? Yeah, the, certainly from my experience, I am really encouraged and heartened. I think there's been quite a shift anyway that's been going on over the past five to eight years around schools broadening their perspective on behaviour. Um, and so I'm finding certainly that schools are really open to looking at doing things a bit differently, whether or not it's around children's behaviour or indeed, as I say, around staff wellbeing. And do you think this will last? I mean, are you kind of opening up relationships and dialogues here um, where you're looking at the medium and the long term? Or is this a question of let's grab this moment while we can and uh, <laughs> okay, whilst people are receptive? That's, that, that's a great question. Um, I would say a mixture of the two, but I want to focus myself personally upon the long term. So I think there's absolutely an opportunity here that's been presented to us in part because I, I'm noticing that school leaders are, are finding even greater courage to say, yes, we're about the academic, but in the middle of a global pandemic, we have to take, care, great, take greater care and attend to more of the emotional and psychological. So how can we do that? So, I, so I'm finding more doors are opening at the moment for me. But what I want to be doing is very much forging long term relationships with schools. Who are, who are not just going to be responding or reacting in the here and now, but looking to see that this is actually an actual fact. Carving, they are carving a path forward, which I think is going to offer opportunities for a more holistic approach to education. And what does that, you know, kind of look like? Because there are all sorts of different people who will be listening and some will be, um, you know, teaching assistants, learning support, mm. behaviour mentors, but there will also be heads and trust leads, all sorts of different people. What are our different responsibilities within that kind of hierarchy or pecking order in terms of getting this right for our children to help them sort of grow through this? Yeah. Um... Big question, sorry. <laughs> it, is, right? it is a big question, but that's fine. We, we can start to unpick that. I suppose I'm starting to think about it perhaps in, in different, um, in terms of different cohorts of staff. I think in terms of classroom-based staff, when I would include there the TAs, um, pastoral mentors, and like perhaps doing withdrawn work, I think, I think for them what it is that they can be doing um, is very much more of the same, more of what they're doing. Perhaps giving themselves a bit more grace to be focusing um, definitely on the emotional and the relational side of things. Um, topping up their, their knowledge and understanding, because we have learned so much, haven't we, Pookie? I mean, when we think about, about the strides that have been made in neuroscience, attachment theory and the like, and it's all very relevant for ourselves within the classrooms. Um, and I think alongside that, definitely them giving themselves permission for self-care, because at the end of the day, mm -hmm. we can only give out what we've got within ourselves. And I think they're moving into think, considering other cohorts that you mentioned there in terms of staff, staff within schools. I think, I think for leadership teams, I think there's sometimes quite a significant challenge of realising that, that the more conventional behavioural approaches are just not hitting the mark. In other words, um, yes, we, we can revisit, we can revamp our behaviour systems, but when we've got an increasing number of children and young people coming into our schools who are experiencing trauma who are experiencing um, a range of, of emotional challenges just ratcheting up the the, the rewards and consequences it it yeah it, it it just doesn't hit the mark so we need to we need to be exploring more and more the more sophisticated and more nuanced approaches around behavior which which as i say school leaders are finding more courage to do because it, it, it is not an easy path to go down. It's far easier to have, you've got your behaviour policy, we've got <laughs> our systems, and the youngsters, they either behave or they don't. And if they don't, well, then they move elsewhere. And, and as I say, school leaders are being far more compassionate and brave around that now. Why does it take bravery to do that? That's a good question as well. Why does it take bravery? Um, it, it, it takes bravery, courage for, for school leaders because... In the first instance, if you're a school leader and you know that staff are doing the best that they can with the resources that they've got and they are facing incredibly challenging behaviours sometimes within their own classrooms, for a school leader to say, actually, no, we're not going to go down the road of exclusion. We're going to explore some other alternatives. That takes courage. That takes bravery. 
because they absolutely risk um, staff being quite resistant to, 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 to an alternative approach. Um, they, they risk staff feeling they're not on, on their side, as it were, not being supportive of them. And indeed, with parents and the wider community, um, the courage to, to, to really put, put a line in the sand and say, no, we are a school community and we are going to do all that we can to, to, to be truly inclusive here. And I can think of a couple of head teachers here who, in particular, who have really gone the extra mile in that regard. And is this the sort of thing where you've got to get everybody on board or are you able to, to kind of carry some passages and hope that they will be converted after a while? And how long do you have to give it a go for? Yeah. So first things first, my experience, um, I mean, for a start, if, if, if I'm being invited into school that, to, to actually do this sort of work, that, that there have to be at least a few people who are, who are along this path at a certain point. And, and I always tend to think of it strategically from the point of view of that you'll have your core who, who are already there and, and who are hungry to learn more about these different approaches around behavior. You've then got then in the next concentric circle, those who are, who are open to a different approach, who are not really embedded and welded to the more traditional conventional approaches around behavior, but what they need is, is really good quality CPD. Often I would suggest coaching and maybe supervision as well, and the place of supervision within schools, again, is, is, is starting to be explored more. And then I guess as, as with, it, with any organization, you're always going to have those, the, those colleagues who are right on the outer edges, who are perhaps, although I always hold out a hope that change is possible, they're perhaps going to be very resistant to that. Um, and I guess that then my hope is, is that as the leadership come round um, and, and gather around in terms of in terms of strengthening the school ethos, those colleagues will either find that they've either got to get on board, as it were, and perhaps need some additional support around that. And in terms of time, that will take longer. Or indeed, they might decide this is not the school for me now. And I think that's a far better position that they actually exercise their own autonomy and say, this is not what I signed up for and I'm going to look elsewhere. Um, and I suppose in terms of time, I mean, typically now, I, I would have thought that, that, that in terms of the CPD and the coaching, I think that you're looking at, at a good year of, of, of doing some quite deep dives into existing policies and practices, CPD, um, some coaching, as I say, so, so that for those staff who would really benefit from, from looking in more detail at their practice, they've actually got that option. And then after that first year, looking at, so what is it we need to do in different schools, will be in different places in order, to, in order to, to, to sustain this, to keep the momentum going. And what do you look for in terms of success? Because presumably it sounds like you're building relationships with schools here and you're going on that journey kind of with them. And mm. how do you know if you're getting it right and, and, and not? Presumably sometimes there's some course correction that needs to go on there. Yeah, sure. So how, the, how is it I know that I'm getting it right? I will know that I'm getting it right, I guess. I'm encouraged when, when, when on subsequent visit, visits, staff will say, um, I actually tried to try tried something that, that, that you suggested, Steve, and not even that, that, that they then say that it worked, but they're able to say it didn't quite work, but then I remembered what you said about the theory behind it, so I tweaked things a little bit, and indeed, we're now starting to see progress. It's small steps, but I'm looking at this youngster through a different set of lenses now. Um, so that is, that is a real um, positive there. Um, and then for myself, it would be essentially, particularly over time, as you're walking around the school, I mean, we can't walk around schools much at the moment, but walking around the school and, and noti noticing that, that shift in ethos, um, perhaps in, in specific pockets of the school, whereby perhaps the practices weren't quite aligned to the school's values, and now they are more so. And you pick that up, don't you, within the emotional tone, the climate within the classrooms and along the corridors. And do you tend to see or, or learn about kind of impact on some of those, you know, core things which leaders are always being held to account on in terms of things like attendance and attainment and those sorts of issues as well? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, uh, and I think that here that's, that's because there is such a strong link, isn't there, in terms of how, how, how all learning has an emotional base. 
So, so the more care that's being taken around the emotional component to being in the classroom, to the teaching and learning, then we're going to see progress and strides in terms of attainment. And sometimes for some colleagues, that's, that's the tricky bit for them to get their heads around. It's like, I've got all this curriculum to teach, Steve, but you're saying to me that I need to spend time making sure I'm doing a proper meet and greet. That's, that's lost teaching time. It's lost learning time. It's like, no, it's not actually. It's going to enhance the teaching and learning ultimately. So tell me about a meet and greet. What, what, what do you mean by that and why is it important? Yeah, sure. So, so meet and greet. Well, this is what, again, most if not all, all teachers will do in various ways. But essentially for myself, this is about how is it that I as a teacher make sure that as best as I can, I'm, I'm, I'm reassuring the youngsters as they come in through the classroom door that I've noticed them, that I'm here for them. Um, that I'm very present for them. And this can take various forms, can't it? I know having worked in secondary schools that it could be quite a formal meet and greet at the classroom door. I say formal because there's, there's, there's very much a clear routine to that. But, but although it, it might be formal, in actual fact, what, what I'd want to do is to be quite informal around that. So as I'm meeting and greeting at the door, yes, I'll be checking out around uniform, et cetera, et cetera. But it's but it's how I check that out. And if I can do it with sometimes a touch of humor, that light touch, that again is actually helping, helping the youngsters to start to relax, perhaps bring down their levels of cortisol for those who are a bit buzzed up and a bit stressed as they come in through the door. And then continuing that on throughout the lesson, checking in with certain youngsters, building on that meet and greet, letting them know, as I say, that I'm there, that I'm tuned into them. And do you have, um, you know, would you have particular pupils in mind? As you say, there'd be some that you might sort of check in with. Are they the ones who are, um, oh, well, who would they be? <laughs> who would they be? Um, well, this again is where teachers are so canny at knowing those youngsters who will actually benefit from it. So it may well be the youngster who, who in my class, if I haven't given them some attention for let's say for sake of argument, five or six minutes, they're gonna to start to bubble up a little bit and they will look to get my attention mm -hmm. in ways that are quite maladaptive, but, they're, but they are performing that function of, it isn't so much attention seeking as attention needing or connection seeking. Um, so there'll be those youngsters, um, but also of course we've got those, the, the, those youngsters of, of, of whatever age who are perhaps particularly quiet, and I wonder, well, what's that about? Is it just that they're quiet, that's part of their personality, or do I indeed need to look beyond that behavior and perhaps find, find some sometimes more subtle, gentler ways to come alongside them? Because they're perhaps not quite so open to me being so explicit in checking out how they are. But it's important that you connect. Yeah, connection. It's connection all the way, isn't it? And do you use these same or similar strategies when working with the families? Because for me, very often when working with uh, challenging, uh, interesting behaviour in kids, then sometimes we find that the, the families can be interesting too. <laughs> they can indeed. And some of my, genuinely, some of my most rewarding work has been working with um, particularly adoptive and foster mm. carers and parents. And what's been fascinating there, Pookie, actually, is that quite often, I mean, again, I'll be using a lot of transactional analysis. Um, and I say a lot of it because, because it just makes sense to people really quickly. And, and, and something in particular that comes to mind is that I, I remember sharing, sharing with this particular group, the behaviorals, who are looking at the different stages of development that, that their own children have moved through. They were, the parents and carers were very quickly making links to how will well, well, given that I then I fostered them and, and then adopted this child and that process started at the age of four, I can see how that created quite a rupture in that youngster's development. Mm -hmm. So we then look at the affirmations. What is it, what, which of these lovely messages is gonna support that youngster? And what was really powerful was that a couple of parents and carers quite spontaneously said, ah, I didn't get that when I was a child. I didn't get that in my childhood. And there's that real moment, I can almost feel it now, of a, a, certainly a, a tinge of sadness, also a, how brave is that that you've actually said that? And then leading into, well, growing up takes a lifetime. Mm. 
Mm. So maybe in actual fact to support you with your parenting, is your parenting um, Abigail here, who, who, who we're talking about, perhaps it's also about what is it that you need in your ongoing development and support? Which of these affirmations sing to you that you'd like to experience more of? And that can then start to really um, cre create quite a shift because it helps the parents and carers, just as it does with the teachers and the other staff. It helps them to perhaps shift away from sometimes blaming the child or the young person for their behavior to understanding a bit more, bit more about the interaction or the transactions that are going on within the family. See, that all makes such sense. But the thing I'm wondering is how you break down the wall to get to the point where you're having these conversations, because surely for many of these adults, they're not people who are going to be open to having this kind of conversation right away. No, no, they're not. And so that's where it's down to, I suppose it, it is a couple of things here. It's about being respectful, um, knowing as a parent myself how how tough that is. So never going in from the point of view of, I'm an expert. Yes, I have a specialist knowledge that I'm happy to share with you. Um, so quite often, a lot, a lot of it is, is exactly what, what you'll be doing. And many professionals that are in our minds at the moment, we're doing around that rapport building. And sometimes parents are quite open fairly early on. And other times we need to we need to engage in with, with them, um, perhaps less around the behaviour, more finding out about, a bit more about what's going on for themselves in the first instance. And indeed, if, if there's still resistance, then maybe I'm not the right person to be doing that piece of work. Um, I think that's, that, that's an important dimension to this. And is that true sometimes for the adults in school that they're not, you know, they're not gelling with a, with a child, say, mm. and that maybe a different adult might be a better fit? Yes, yeah. Absolutely, and I'm thinking. I'm thinking in particular of of those youngsters with attachment-related needs, who can be really tricksy to connect with. And for whatever reason, I'm just not gelling with this youngster. And maybe it's part something on my part as well. If I'm really honest, mm -hmm. we can't like all the children, and young people who come across our paths. No. Um, or indeed, perhaps it is something within. It is something about me that that youngster is projecting onto me. Maybe it is the fact that I'm tall, that I'm a man, that I wear glasses. Sometimes it's interesting actually when it comes to, to behaviour. Sometimes stuff, stuff will say, I just don't know what the triggers are, there aren't any triggers. And it's like, well, sometimes that the, actually the trigger is us and therefore another adult may well be a better person mm. to start to work with this youngster. Yeah, I always remember um, in um, Bruce Perry's book, uh, the boy who's raised as a dog mm. and he talks in one of the chapters about how he essentially just by being a, a man and he would like roll up his sleeve to look more manly to kind of help a child become exposed to a, a male presence that they could learn to trust and mm. yeah as you say sometimes just as, as that adult we we can be the trigger and, and I think sometimes there as well that um, children can be drawn towards the most unlikely seeming adults because of the ones that they feel perhaps more familiar yes. with so yeah yes. yeah that can be challenging. What can go wrong and what do we do when it goes wrong? In, in relation to? Uh, children's behaviour. So maybe we're trying these things and we perhaps are working in a school where it used to be a bit more kind of rewards and sanctions. Um, and we're finding that we're, we're getting some blow ups in behaviour. Um, sure. How do we, how do we deal with yeah. That? So what can go wrong and what can we do? Well, what can go wrong? I guess in terms of along that journey, if we're moving moving away from the rewards and sanctions. For some youngsters, they are, they're perhaps gonna feel a bit more confused by that because of course rewards and sanctions do give a real sense of predictability. Um, so we might find that there are a few more blow ups. And I think that, that, that in part, in terms of approaching those, those situations, I think in the first instance, it's about the leadership team being, being, being ready for that and, and, and anticipating them, expecting those, those, those glitches. And, and holding firm, it's like, yes, we expect that there are going to be some glitches here, but we're going to hold fast to this path. We're not just going to immediately swing back in and get the old rewards and sanctions back in place. I think also being um, in, in terms of with the children, and young people themselves, I think being, being as explicit and as honest with them as well at times. So, for example, for the, it might be that, that there are some youngsters who actually start to drift around their behaviour, perhaps testing the boundaries. And I do think that there's a place for actually being quite clear of, yeah, we, 
we are trying things differently here because essentially what we want as a school is for you to go out into the world um, fully rounded, taking responsibility for your own behaviours and your own actions, flourishing, thriving. And what we've, uh, uh, and the, con the, the conclusion that we've reached is having rewards and sanctions in such a rigid system, actually, that it, it just becomes a game. I'm thinking particularly here of, of upper key stage two and secondary age youngsters who will be able to engage in this conversation. They know it's a game. It's like, well, well, what we're wanting to do is called intrinsic motivation. It's about you doing the right thing because you want to do the right thing, not yeah. because you're frightened of the punishments and consequences. So we're still in charge around here. There's still that safety, but it might be quite a tricky journey for us to be engaging on. My printer's making noise in the background for <laughs> no explicable reason. <laughs> um, yeah, that makes sense. And so, and that's, I think that touches on a really interesting point about kind of readiness for life, because I think it's one thing, isn't it? Getting children kind of through school and meeting the, the targets there and managing that. But actually, we want children who are going to go out into the world and, and enjoy it and fulfill their potential and be able to navigate the ups and downs. And, and presumably that, you know, you, you're aiming much more for, for, for that with, with this approach. Absolutely. And I think actually just just to throw into the mix here, I said quite early on um, during our chat here that in terms of sharing the transactional analysis, it's not just sharing it with the staff. Mm -hmm. Eric Burns um, benchmark in terms of the core ideas that he was that he was developing was that a, a, a typical seven year old, seven, eight year old will be able to grasp some of these ideas themselves so for example that idea of the parent adult child ego state you start to you, you start to talk to children and i've done this with children from the age of seven upwards um you start to talk to them about the idea of a parent ego state so sometimes we can be bossy are you bossy with your brother or sister but you're not a parent but you're behaving like a bossy parent mm -hmm. and i bet there are also times when you're the caring parent and you look after your younger brother or sister and so we start to offer then the children insights into their own behaviors and they have a language to talk about their behavior. And so that in itself goes back to that whole idea around how well, around education. We know as educators, although the system is very much around exams and just cramming in lots and lots of knowledge, we know as educators we're, we're about so much more than that. And so, as I say, TA really offers some some rich opportunities to be to be developing and guess what we've referred to as emotional literacy there interesting talking about the idea of the yeah the children needing to be able to understand that and really apply it and presumably when you're looking for that kind of yeah whole whole school or whole setting kind of ethos having the children really on board with it would make quite a big difference oh absolutely absolutely and i've been in in classrooms where where teachers have felt and, and again, this is about perhaps sometimes having a bit of courage on the, on the teacher's part. Teachers have been actually very happy to engage in conversations with, with their pupils, with their students, and ask them to be spotting, well, just now, when I started to, 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 to raise my voice at so-and-so, which, which ego state do you think I was in there? And the hands will go up and say, bossy parent, bossy parent. And of course, the children, young people love it because they're actually having an opportunity to, in inverted commas, tell the, tell the adult off. But, it, but in actual fact, that becomes really empowering because it starts to, 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 to enrich the classroom culture. The teacher is still being in charge, and that's a key message to staff. Just because we're having these, these more honest, conversations with the youngsters it doesn't mean that you're not in charge anymore it actually helps me to be more grounded as an adult because i've got this language this framework and i can use that with the youngsters i can say indeed to the youngsters i'm noticing that i'm about to go into that bossy parents that nag 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 i don't want to do that so i'm wondering what could i do now to make sure that i don't do that anybody got any ideas and so okay. we get that collaborative nature then going on within the classroom. And I'm, I'm wondering here about the different states, um, sort of parent, adult, child, and whether they're kind of equal, because it, it feels a bit like child would be the lesser state, but then you talked about the importance of fun and play earlier. So yes, absolutely. Yeah, it's a, great, a really great pick up there, Pookie, because, because sometimes when people come across the idea of parent, adult, child, they, 
they can mistakenly believe that what they need to do is to very much be in the adult ego state, that grounded, attuned to what's going on around me, being in the moment. And yes, there's absolutely that dimension, but as you quite rightly say, there are times when within the classroom, drawing upon that child ego state, which is about that zestfulness, that curiosity, imagination, a bit of spark about me, that's what's needed. And equally, the parent, the parent ego state, yes, it can be, I can tip into being very bossy at times, but of course the children, the young people, they need that parent ego state within the classroom to be holding the boundaries, to be offering that structure. Makes sense. And I'm guessing that there is a, uh, you, you have clearly got a bit of a sense of fun about you as well. If anyone who's listening can't see your braces, which are covered in guitars, and it would be wrong yes. to ask you, tell, tell, tell me about the guitars you mentioned. Yeah, sure. Well, well this, the, or rather these, these braces um, are, are my bit of fun off, off the back of attending one of Lisa Cherry's webinars, where she was talking about the importance of presence, visual presence, when we're working um, virtually. But yes, the guitars, the guitar braces, I've been into guitars um, since I was about 10 years old and first heard Apache by The Shadows. I was challenged by my dad to learn it on a very um, old nylon string guitar. Got my head around it sufficiently for him to then buy me an electric guitar. And ever since then, yeah, guitar music is, is absolutely um, my, my go-to. And, and especially at the moment with all the stresses and pressures, I can just immerse myself. And yes, and there is something about that childlike state then actually and I can pretend that I am Eric Clapton or Gary Moore up on stage, <laughs> even though I'm just strumming in the, in the sitting room or in my bedroom. I love that. Do you ever use that in your um, kind of teaching, the, the idea of you know, having those things that we do just for fun? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. The importance that when we're thinking about how it is that we use our energy, particularly at the moment, staff in schools there's so much energy a heck of a lot of energy into being in charge isn't there yeah um and i would say even and i and i think really very much around that, that that um new routines different expectations because of covid and plenty of care so all that energy going out there and with my hand I'm sort of pushing it upwards but what about the energy that's related to that more creative um sparky self at times as well and, 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 and indeed the importance of, of getting out into nature and and i think the thing here pookie is that is that all that i'm saying here i know is absolutely common sense we all know what what it is that we need to do to take better care of ourselves what i like and i'm perhaps sounding a bit evangelical here about transactional analysis what i love about transactional analysis is that is it helps me to understand even more so how important those things are and I think that that's something that I offer then schools when I'm going into the schools. If I'm doing something around well-being, it is not going to be Indian head massager, massages and that. As fantastic as they are, it's more about how do we use our energy and what's the balance of our energy at the moment? And perhaps the importance, in fact, not just perhaps the importance of our own self-care. And I wonder how we go about helping our staff to give themselves permission to exercise that self-care. Because as you say, we know that we should be doing this. And yet I think particularly right now, staff are holding a lot, aren't they? It feels like our school staff are holding not only our children, but many of our families as well. And yeah. we're looking to them to be this kind of stable, persistent, consistent mm -hmm. adults in our mm -hmm. lives. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a lot of pressure, isn't it? It is. And I love that phrase holding, just to say, before I come on to the permission, because I think I think that really does encapsulate what, what is happening for people at the moment. They're holding an awful lot. Mm. Um, and I think that that, term, that that word permission is absolutely spot on, actually, because I think many of us individually struggle to give ourselves permission to look after ourselves. We tend to have perhaps that belief of you just crack on, head down, keep going, keep going, don't let the emotions come up because we don't want that to happen because what's gonna happen then? What's gonna happen about our mental health? And so what, one, of the most, one of the most powerful things school leaders can do at the moment, and there's an interesting win-win here, one of the most powerful things they can do is, is in giving permission to staff. How do they do that? Well, they give permission to themselves first. So I was coaching a head teacher only yesterday and she was saying to me, two things that she started to do um, since COVID kicked in. Um, the first thing is that she has now stopped working of an evening. And so she shuts her laptop down and she battles with the, 
that there are not enough hours in the day. And if I'm shutting this laptop down now, what on earth is there still going to be to do? Mm. But she's, she's stealing herself because she knows that she's given everything during that day. So she's now leaving the school earlier, which is giving a message out to staff. She's also now um, revamped the staff meetings. Like, like many schools, they are virtual. So she makes sure that staff have enough time to get home and they then do a virtual staff meeting for about an hour, hour and a quarter, and then that's it. And staff are then home. And they're not going back into the classrooms, doing the marking and the preparation and the like. Um, and then the third thing that she said that she's doing is that of a lunchtime, she's going out into the school garden and just doing a bit of gardening. Oh, wow. And again, so she, it's a win-win. She's taking care of herself and giving that really powerful message out to staff. It is okay to put yourself first at times. Yeah, that role modelling is so important, isn't it? It is. It wow. is. If, if I could just come in at that point, at this point, actually, there's a lovely quote by a guy called Parker Palmer. Let's see if I can get this right. Self-care is never a selfish act. It is, it is the only gift that I have to give myself as I then seek to give the gift of myself to the rest of the world. It's something, I'm paraphrased it slightly there. That's but good. I think that's beautiful, that is. Yeah, that is. And, and so, yes, yeah, so wise, actually. So true, isn't it? And mm. I think we know this on a theoretical level, but actually putting it into practice can be very, very challenging, can't yeah. it? I think, yeah. you know, you, you know, you, you and I, we have to hold ourselves to account there as well, because we're trying to le lead the leaders. And uh... <laughs> Indeed, indeed. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, and I've been clocking that for, for myself in terms of working from home so much, mm. noticing how my boundaries are not so clear at times, but also making sure that I'm doing things such as, make, um, for example, absolutely booking my, my coaching supervision, for example, making sure that I'm topping myself up um, from that point of view yeah yeah it's really important wow we've covered a lot what um what thought would you like to to leave people with what would be your closing thought give yourself permission to put yourself first um it, it is all too easy i think to get caught up in martyrdom at its worst level or at its most extreme level um, people have come into education, they have come into it because they're wanting to make a difference. Absolutely. And I think there's something about honouring yourself and that sense of purpose of vocation and honouring it by making sure that you are indeed exercising that self-care, that you're recognising that you're not being selfish. Because when you, when you do exercise that self-care, you're going to go back into the classroom, back to your staff, replenish just with that little bit more to give out at a time when you are holding and containing so much. Mm -hmm.